When I was on holiday recently, I had the opportunity of taking big chunks of time out in the morning to pray. And I don't know about you, but this is one of the ways that God speaks to me. I start praying for somebody or somebodies, and, and then suddenly it's like a wind of heaven just comes in the prayer, and oh, it just ignites something, and that prayer comes alive, and you find your heart burning with passion, and you begin to push into prayer and intercession about a theme, a word, a vision, a picture, but there's life and passion and the heart of God, in it. and the more you go, it grips you, and you know, oh, this isn't just a prayer, but this is a, this is a prophetic desire from God. This isn't a prayer request. This isn't a, a praying out of duty. This isn't what I should be doing, but God's heart is in this, and the prayer is praying through the outcome. You know what I mean, don't you? And it's one of the ways that we can hear the voice of God. When I was praying for the new wine leaders that are connected to new wine, that's you guys. Uh, when I was praying, this, this, this verse of scripture landed in the words of my prayer and the wind of God got hold of it and propelled me into prayer for you. And I think there is something about God's wisdom and intentionality for us over this prayer that I just want to preach it, I want to prophesy it, I want you to get it into your spirit, I want you to be encouraged by it, because I think this is something of the heart of God and something of the counsel of God for us as a leadership network in this moment of time. And I'm hopefully going to be able to do it in about 25 minutes, but there again, I can always ask forgiveness. Could I have the first uh, slide up? I press on, this is Paul speaking, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal or the mark to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ. The first thing I, I want to say to you to, 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 as we leave this conference and we go our separate ways, it is a time to forget what has passed. It's a time to, to put the past behind us. It is a time to not let the challenges, the failures, the pain, the desperation, the discouragement, and the wounds of the past to dictate and determine our future. There are things that we draw upon our past which shape our future in a positive way, but there are times when we just have to draw a line, put it behind us, call it a day, and not let our own anxiety, our own um, uh, uh, our own, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, sense of inadequacy and the enemy to rob us of our future and distract our mind and our energies and our emotions and our passions for what we're going for. The kingdom is the now and it is the future. The now and the future. And we need to, we need to celebrate the now. We thank God for the past, but we press on to the future. Now, there's some things that we really need to draw a line on. And I felt it very strongly this morning as we were praying. Some of us need to put a past to personal failure. Put an end to it. It's gone. Don't let the reproach of the past stop you and rob you of confidence in your future. We're all broken. We all walk with a limp. We've all made mistakes. We've all had our sins and we've all had our mess ups. We all have our regrets. There's not a person living in the room who hasn't got some pain or despair or disappointment in their life or some regret. But the enemy can keep throwing that back at us and, and cause you not to run with perseverance and confidence. We need to know that we are sanctified, we are forgiven, we are renewed, we are made new. The past is broken, the enemy's off our back, our chains have gone. He's with us, he's not against us, he's for us, he qualifies us, we're clothed in righteousness. And, uh, and he will move even through our brokenness and through our weakness. We are the only church he's got right now in Wales. You are the people you've been praying for. 
You are the people that you've been waiting for. It is you, it is my time. And now is the hour for us to draw a line. We've had a lot of ministry from the Holy Spirit about dealing with stuff today. When we walk out of this room and we get back into our cars, we just have to accept by faith it's a done deal and not let the enemy get another hook or hold upon us to rob us of our confidence, shake it off, forget what's behind, press on to the future. There's personal failures that God is now giving you permission to let go of and move on. Let it go, move on. (laughs) Secondly, ministry failures. When I say ministry failures, I don't really mean ministry failures, but we interpret our challenges and our difficulties and our lack of fruitfulness as failures. They're not failures, they're just part of the journey. As Christy said, they're just opportunities to learn. Let's not use that term, but let, for the sake of it, I know how our minds think. We said, I messed up, I failed, I could have done it better. This isn't working. I'm useless, I'm rubbish. Everybody else is succeeding except me. I'm discouraged. Have you been to conferences that you wanted to be encouraged, but you've left discouraged? Have you been times when other people's stories and testimonies and success has discouraged you? Have you experienced that? I've experienced that. I know what it's like. When you just don't want to hear another success story because the pain of your struggle is not marrying up to the hope of your vision and it just hurts so much and you feel a failure, you feel fruitless and you feel you never get there. Have you ever experienced that? I know you have. It's time to put our past perceived ministry leader failures behind us. Put it behind us. There's no such thing. We're on a journey. God is preparing us through every step of our lives for this great and glorious future that we have together. Put it behind us. Let's move on. Now, I want to say another thing. Your challenges and your past and your struggles are your vindication. What I mean by that, if you didn't have challenges and struggles and past you wouldn't be pressing into the purposes of God. It, it's the very thing that vindicates your call. It's the very thing that vindicates that you're a prophetic person pressing into the purposes of God. Because every time God speaks, every time God challenges, there is what we call a prophetic crisis. It's a crisis when God speaks and it all goes wrong. God speaks and nothing happens. God speaks and it gets worse. God, you're pressing forward and you feel like you're going backwards. You feel as if, I know God has spoken, I'm knowing the will of God, but it, I'm never, I never seem to get there. It's just not working. It's a prophetic crisis. You go through scripture. Joseph, you're going to be a president and a prime minister and your brothers will bow down before you. Your father will bow down before you. It's going to be great. And what happens? He tells his father, he father rebukes him he tells his brother they throw him in a pit hardly the road to a president it's a prophetic crisis when the prophetic word comes when you hear the call when you get the vision you have the conviction you're pumped with faith you say yes to it you give yourselves to it then there is a moment when prophetic crisis comes that you're aligning yourself with the vision but there's hurdles before you sometimes stopping you sometimes pushing you back but these things are allowed to actually develop your character your faith and your perseverance that qualifies you to be able to steward the harvest when it comes to you the lord allows it so that actually even though we're doing all the right things we know at the end of the day we can't do it because of our gift we can't do it because of our personality we can't do it because of our finances we can't do it because of all the administration or the clever stuff we do we just can't do it unless god does it at the end of the day there is a moment when we do everything but god steps in Moses, take this people out out of the clutches and the claws of Pharaoh. Take them out. He's got a call from God. And just so you know that this is me, put your hand in your breast pocket. Oh, it's leprosy. Put it back out again. Oh, it's gone. Throw that stick on the floor. Oh, it's turned into a, a, um, a serpent. Uh, and pick it up again. Oh, it's a stick again. That's just, I just to know that you've heard from me. I'm with you. This is a big deal, Moses. Moses, the sovereign Lord 
from heaven and earth has heard the pain and the cry of my people. And now I am coming down. I am coming down. I'm stooping down to rescue them and deliver them through you, Moses. Know this. I am who I am. I am the creator of heaven and earth. I am the almighty God. I am with you, Moses. Now go. Okay, then. And he goes to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, no. No. And when he says yes, they're caught between the Red Sea and the desert and the whole Egyptian army about them. That's a prophetic crisis. We're stuck. We're going to drown. We're going to be killed. But you said you were with me. You said you were going to do this thing. It's all going wrong. It's a prophetic crisis. And it comes to the point where it can only have deliverance and you can only press forward because God breaks through. He parts the Red Sea. He breaks into the crisis. He does what we cannot do after we've done everything. Prophetic crisis. Abraham, you're going to have a child. Sarah is too old to have one. And then the time goes on and on and on and on. In the book of Romans, it says, Abraham looked at his body and he considered it as dead. In other words, he couldn't do it. But God, he says, but he considered the promises of God as true. And he did. When we started Cornerstone Church, I knew God had called me to start Cornerstone Church. I remember the day he called me. I left that very meeting when I heard him call me to move to this area, start a church. That very day I had a car crash. Wrote the car off. The day we started the church in our house, Sarah and myself was 29 years old, five young people between the age of 23. Just a handful of us, and then a, a couple uh, age 40. Didn't know what we were doing green as grass. I remember the first evening we started, we sang a song, somebody walked at our garden path and smashed our window. Then there was hexagrams, satanic hexagrams drawn all over the wall of our front house. And then I would wake up in the morning and say, what's all this tape? What's all this tape around the garden? I didn't know what it was. And then we got burgled, not once or twice, 16, 17 times. We were burglars. We'll go out and serve the community. We were lifting the area, letting them know we're going to do an event on. When we were out, all the burglars came in. We only had 35 pounds to start. We had no money. We didn't, go, we didn't go without food for one day, or two days, or three days. We just couldn't eat for days on end. At the end, we decided to turn into a fast to make it easier. There times we didn't eat. No, seriously. There times we didn't eat for 30 days. So we passed fast and pray and give the kids porridge. We said, we can't eat. We haven't got any money. We're being burgled. Our cars were being stolen. I bought a car. It was a white car. I only had it a few days because somebody stole it. And then I managed, okay, I scraped some money around, and I bought another one. And then within a fortnight, that had got stolen. And I realized, and then somebody told me, do you know what they're doing? They play snooker in your area. They buy a white car uh, in the evening. Uh, they steal a white car in the evening, and then they steal a red car. And then they steal a white car and a red car. And they go through all the colors of a snooker table till they get to black. And they try and get to black and steal a black car at the end of the evening before sunset rise. And I was finding every white car I was buying was being stolen because every other car was a white one they had to steal. So I got over this problem. I bought a black car. No, seriously. That's how I got over it. But it was desperate. And it was hard going. And we didn't have any finances. And we didn't have any resources. And we were burgled. And then people were leaving us all the time. They said, oh, this, I'd love to be involved in the Pioneer George until they realized you've got to lay your life down. And there is no Sunday school provision. Because the only kids were there were, were our kids. And they're about three and four and five. There is no Sunday school provision. There is no band. I was the guy, and Sarah was I, who opened up putting up the chairs, putting up the music stand. And it was so rubbish and broken that every time I play, I'd hit it and it'd fall over. And then the microphone would screech against the one single speaker that we had up in the community hall that actually had no windows. And when we left in the morning, the kids would take a mattress and put it in the front gate and put petrol on it and burn it so nobody could get out. And nobody wanted to join us. So when they did join us, I was not staying around here. And people just leave and leave and leave. And it breaks your heart. Because every time somebody says, I like you, but I'm leaving, you feel like you're being broken up with. Like somebody's dumping you. Let's still be friends. 
Let's have coffee every time again. But I don't want to live with you. I don't want to stay with you. I don't want to journey with you. And you've got a passion for this thing. And you lose one person in a small church. And it's like, it's like 75% of your church is going. And it's hard. And it breaks you. And it's difficulty. And then when, when my, my real close friend uh, from, from Bible College, Phil Hills, opened up his amazing extension in the Elam Church in Swansea. And I was thrilled for him. And we went down to the meeting, and as I got over the car, there was somebody who'd joined our church, greeted me in a stewardship badge of the, of the, of the new church. Oh, oh, by the way, as I was getting on the car, oh, welcome to the meeting. We're leaving you, and we're joining this church. I have no problem with Phil we talked about. It. This isn't an issue issue. This isn't, but what that did, that, that moment when I saw the success of my friend, and I was delighted for him. What it did, it accentuated the pain of the journey that we were going through. And it broke my heart. And do you know, it brought me to the end where I couldn't carry on. I said to Sarah, I just do not have the mental, emotional, physical, spiritual energy and perseverance to carry on anymore. I just don't think I can do it another day. And Sarah's never seen me in this way before. Because like you and me, most of, our, most of us in leaders have an amazing amount of personal resource to keep going under pressure. But I came to the end of it. And Sarah called around a few of the church that we had left and said, you better pray for Julian. I've never seen him like this before. And this is how it felt. It felt like I was falling, 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 falling. And I fell and I hit this rock and that rock was this. Jesus Christ is true. And he has called me to build this church. When I came to the end of everything, when I had come to the end of my own ability to keep going, when I had nothing left in me, the only thing I had was the rock of Christ that he is true and, that he is, and the faith that he had called me. And I picked myself up, not with my own strength, but the energy and the, the faith brings to stand again, and that was the turning point. When, when, when we persevered with everything that we had, we, opposition after opposition, discouragement after discouragement, but then the prophetic crisis came when God broke in, in our greatest despair, in our greatest failure, in our greatest weakness, and it just began to turn from that moment. I want to say that that was my moment of vindication. That was my moment when God said, I'm with you. I've called you. I'm going to do this thing. Don't despair of your struggle, your challenge, your weakness, your lack of resources when it goes wrong when people leave you, when, we, when you go for something that doesn't work. Don't despair. It's your vindication. And so I want to encourage you. It's a time to put the past behind you. Your personal failure, your ministry failure. It's a time to forget what, behi what is behind and press on towards the goal But you say, I can't, I'm too exhausted. How do I do that? How do I, how do I press on? This is how we do it. This is what Paul says. I set my, my I, I press on towards the mark. I set my gaze, I fix my eye on the mark to which he has called me. In order to press on, we must have a mark we must have a goal. We must have a vision. We must have something that we're moving to. Now, in the first case, it's always Jesus. That's the first one. Always Jesus. That's the one that we're always pressing into and moving towards. But it's Jesus and his call for us as leaders. Jesus first and then outworking the call. But we're not, but I want to say this one thing. It's not any old mark. We really have to be careful here that we don't press on to any mark because there are marks that we can press on to which are great passions, but they don't necessarily carry the presence and the power and the energy of God to move us forward and repel us forward in a particular season. We need to be mindful that it is the mark of God in any particular season. You see, 
When we look at that passage of Scripture, he says, I press on towards the mark for which Christ has taken hold of me. I kind of like the King James Version on this, really. It says, I press on to apprehend the mark for which Christ has apprehended me. Now, the, 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 in the original language, that word apprehend means it's a beautiful word. It means to come down and lay hold of something with great force. So, I'm going to illustrate. Right. God from heaven has come down upon Paul and laid hold of him with great force. That's what apprehend is. He's got hold of him down from heaven. It's what happens when you're arrested by a police officer. I'm apprehending you in the name of the law. And it's to be apprehended. You're caught by the scruff of the neck. And you're apprehended. And it, the apprehension, the, the, the wind of God, the power of God comes down and grips something to drive it forward and take it somewhere. So Paul says, I lay hold of, the, I press on to apprehend the mark, to lay hold of the mark for which Christ has apprehended me. He comes hold of you to drive, with great power and with the great power that he has taken hold of you. He drives you towards the mark for which he has taken hold of you for. Have you got it? So the key is this. If we want to have the wind and the power of God upon our back, we need to face the target for which Christ has set us towards and the, and the direction in which the wind is blowing. The energy comes from facing your eye on the target and your back to the wind of God. You see, there's two ways that we can approach wind. I could turn my face to it. And I'll get exhausted. I could walk crossways into a, with a crosswind and I'll fall over and get blown off course. But if I face my back to the wind, it becomes my energy that causes me to run. And I can run and not be wearied, but I can run with energy and be energized. Face to the target, back to the wind. I take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me with great force. The wind has changed direction in the UK for the church. In the 1960s to I would say the early 1990s, Primarily the wind was the wind of prophetic renewal. We had the charismatic movement, we've had Toronto, we've had great moves of God. It's primarily, the, way, the work that is done in the church has been one of prophetic renewal. We've had a restoration of worship. We've had a restoration of body ministry. We've had a restoration of gifts and the healing and the prophetic stuff. We had a, we've had a re-collaboration, configuration of how we church, do church and what churches. Primarily, we have been renewed in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. We have had a, a different paradigm where it, once it was all word and now it's word and spirit. We have been renewed. The wine of God has been poured into the wineskin, a prophetic renewal, and we have been renewed as the church. It hasn't primarily been a missional wind of God because we haven't really seen many people comparatively come to Christ. In fact, it's got worse in our nation, hasn't it, in terms of people coming to Christ. The church numerically has diminished, but in strength and in passion and in purity and in power and authenticity, it's been renewed. There's been a prophetic wind of renewal. The, the, the wine has been poured into the, into the wineskin of renewal. There's been a wind of renewal, but the wind has changed. The wind now is moving from prophetic renewal into apostolic mission, where the apostolic and the prophetic and the ministry gifts, now with the renewed wind of God and renewed wine, pour it out into mission. Everywhere I go, it's about apostolic mission. Different nations of the world, it's about apostolic mission. Now, what do I mean by apostolic mission? I don't mean a mission that is done by apostles. I mean church that does it the way the apostles did it. It's about sending. It's about nations. It's about our communities. It's about broken people, lost people, blind people, hurting people. 
It's about, and there's a, it's a wind of apostolic mission coming through the church. This is what this conference is all about. This is why we're here. We're not here to be renewed. We're here to be equipped. We're here to be sent. Of course, I don't want to have to qualify everything that I mean. We need continual renewal. You, you know what I mean. But I'm, I'm speaking about general direction here. So what does that mean for us? It means that we now have to face, turn our face towards the task of mission and the wind of God. And that's where the energy comes in. So when we pick our feet, our knee, when we come, uh, move from the place of brokenness, from our knees, and we pick ourselves up again, we say, how do I find the energy to run? How do I find the vitality to do this? How do I just stand and go another time? How do I leave this place to put it into practice? You just turn your face towards the mark of God and your back towards the wind of God and he is your energy. He is your power. He is your resource. And you find in all of your weakness and all of your brokenness, God then comes and does what you and I cannot do. So for us, what does it mean practically? It's setting our face to mobilize and equip our church members to building their confidence, their capacity to live well, share their faith, share their encounters with God, do the stuff that Sarah was talking about and have a confidence and equipping and anointing to pray for people they have not yet, who have not yet encountered Jesus with the healing and with the blessing of God. And we see that we're an authentic people. We have a message, we have a story, and we have a presence and we have a power. It's helping our people to have the skills and the confidence to do that. It's turning our face towards the target. It's being intentional about what we're focusing and what we're teaching and what we're continually going for. It's creating opportunity to meet and engage people with the love and the presence of Jesus in creative new ways, turning to look over to the other side of the boat. It's pushing into words with power and presence and wonders, with miracles and works of compassion and love and service that authenticates the God who loves. You know, God loves us and as we serve with love, it authenticates us and the message. Builds the bridge, creates the trust. It's creating cultures of mission and churches that are accessible to unchurched people and accessible to church people. Jesus was accessible to the insider and the outsider. The insider grew and grew in love with him, and the outsider says, I've discovered something for the first time, and it's amazing. Accessibility to the insider and to the outsider. Setting our face to the mark and our back to the wind in this season and this time. This is what we do as leaders. This is following after what the Father is doing. It's not just for Wales. It's not just for the UK. Right now, it's, it's, there's a global move of God brewing. And oh, I think Europe. The world needs Europe. We can't just ignore the mission field of Europe. You can't let Europe sink into any greater darkness. It's too big. It's too important. It's too much of a history. And God loves it too much. And we've got brothers and sisters over there who need our help just as much as we need their help. We can't isolate ourselves just because there's sea in the water. Oh, I'm not making a political statement, by the way. I'm, I'm talking about a mission, this is a missional intent. Okay. As we go, I just want us to take a moment to settle a few things just to allow the Holy Spirit to breathe a fresh conviction of faith in your heart that you can draw a line on the past. Do you know, you have to do it by faith. You just go say, Lord, I'm going to take you at your word. 
I can move on from the past. I'm not going to let it beat me up anymore. I'm not going to let the fact that I haven't seen the fruit that I want to torment me anymore. I'm going to draw a line in the past. I'm going to see the challenges of my past as the vindication of my prophetic calling. I'm going to stand and press through. I want, I'm going to take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit to just breathe a fresh permission that you give yourself permission to move on from your past. Secondly, I want to invite the Holy Spirit to give us a fresh power for our ministry. So we're moving on, but there's a wind in our back. Power for our ministry. And the third thing I want to do as we close is to ask the Holy Spirit to do this for us, to give us a wisdom for our leadership. Reconfiguring our churches for mission requires wisdom. Do you know the problem with wisdom? It's not prophecy. Have you ever had somebody who comes to you and says, oh, please will you help me, and they want a prophecy. You gave them a prophecy, they'd listen to you. But really what they need is your wisdom. And you give them your wisdom, and they ignore it, because it's not prophecy. Do you know the gift of wisdom is just as much inspired as the gift of prophecy? The problem with wisdom is not prophecy. Do you understand? But if we're going to reconfigure our churches, it's not another prophetic word that we need. It's wisdom as leaders. Wisdom build. Wisdom organizes. By wisdom a house is built. We, we, we got to, we're in the construction business of rebuilding our churches that it can house the presence of God, that it may be poured out for mission. So I'm going to pray. I'm, I'm going to. I don't know if you. If you're anything like me, this is what I need. permission to draw a line on the past. That comes by faith. Power for the preaching, the teaching, the prophesying, and the healing. Power in the ministry. But wisdom to lead. Wisdom to lead. And if that resonates with you. I'm going to stand down here because I need this. I'm not standing up here 12 inches above contradiction. I'm going to stand down here before the throne of Jesus with you, my brothers and sisters. And together, I, I'm going to ask us, Holy Spirit, give us permission to draw on the past. Give us power for the future. Give us wisdom for our leadership. And I'm, I'm going to step down, and that's my standing. But if you connect with this, you stand with me as I stand with you.